Slave labor was a huge aspect of Roman life, and the Republic depended heavily on free work from human beings who had no rights, no possessions, and were left at the whims of their masters to be worked to death, starved, tortured, and sometimes even killed for the sake of enjoyment. Sure, you may have seen Russell Crowe play one in a movie, but chances are you have no idea just how brutal it really was. Today we're exploring what it was really like to be a Roman slave. But before we get started, be sure to subscribe to the Weird History channel. Oh, and one more thing, leave a comment and let us know what topics you would like to hear about. Now, we roam. Slaves in ancient Rome didn't just work as domestic or agricultural workers. They did pretty much every single kind of menial job you can imagine. Generally classified as urban or rural, slaves did everything from cooking and cleaning to mining for silver. On country estates, slaves might perform both domestic and non-domestic tasks, even working as smiths, bakers, and guards. Occasionally, urban slaves would work as accountants and managers for businessmen. If you were a slave that originated as a prisoner of war, you might have been sold off to the public and could have been tasked with fighting fires, tending to public buildings, and even working as an executioner. Some Roman slaves lived their entire lives from birth to death working as the property of a master, but others, who were able to cough up a little dough, had a luckier fate. The oldest and easiest way for a slave to achieve freedom was simply being given freedom by one's master, perhaps in a will, although some sort of ceremony or payment usually went along with it. Some folks became slaves by selling themselves into servitude to repay their debts over a certain amount of time. If that was the case, you'd be freed as soon as your contract was complete. Slaves could also accumulate money by giving a peculium, or account, that they controlled while under the authority of a master. This type of wealth could be land or currency, and although it was technically still under the control of the master, slaves could use this as a tool to purchase their freedom. After buying their freedom, slaves didn't just magically become full-fledged Roman citizens, though. After the process of manumission, aka buying your freedom, these former slaves were more like conditional citizens and became clients of their former owners. They were also restricted from taking public office. And if you were under the age of 30 and wanted to buy your way out of servitude, you were completely out of luck. According to the Roman jurist Gaius, slaves under the age of 30 could not be freed during the first century CE. Being a slave was cruel and unbearable during any time period, and the Roman slaves were no exception. Slaves, who were considered property of the masters, were expected to behave, and if they didn't, the consequences were nightmare fuel. In Maniacomai by Plotus, the second century playwright attributes the following words to Messenio, a slave. Stripes, fetters, the mill, weariness, hunger, bitter cold, fine pay for idleness. That's what I'm mightily afraid of. Surely then, it's much better to be good than to be bad. I don't mind tongue lashings, but I do hate real floggings. Yikes. Slave owners could beat and punish slaves harshly, inflicting everything from whippings to chains and fetters. Masters also had free reign to sell their slaves, execute them by hanging or crucifixion, and make them do the worst possible tasks as punishment. And if you tried to run away, they'd brand you. Yeah, ouch. Nothing sounds less appetizing than limited rations of bread, right? Well, slaves, being the lowest rung of Roman society, were clearly not eating like kings. This guy, Cato the Elder, who was a soldier, statesman, and historian from the 3rd and 2nd centuries BCE, wrote about the daily needs of agricultural slaves, specifically what they should receive for food and drink. According to Cato, slaves should receive wheat to make bread, although shackled slaves who couldn't grind their own grain were to receive bread itself. When slaves worked the fields during the summer, more flour was needed, as was additional wine. If we were working in the hot Roman fields all summer for no money, we'd be in need of additional wine too. In addition to bread and wine, slaves ate what Cato termed relish. This Roman relish, however, was not exactly what you'd find on a baseball stadium hot dog. Instead of pickles, it was made of olives. During the first century BCE, slaves rounded out their diets by gathering wild fruits and vegetables, as well as cultivating crops on their own. Domestic slaves got the opportunity to start urban gardens. Of course, they always had the option of picking at their master's leftovers. While most slaves functioned as a coerced unpaid labor pool, some enslaved men and women got to join the ranks of criminals and prisoners of war in the gladiator ring. Made up mostly from slaves, the first gladiatorial contests appeared as early as the 3rd century BCE. One famous slave, Spartacus, was actually trained in one of Rome's gladiator schools. And if the idea of a gladiator school sounds cool to you, let's just say these gladiator training academies weren't exactly sleepaway camps. 
Gladiators in training were treated more or less like prisoners, but did receive food, medical attention, and specialized apparatus training. Treated more like investments than human beings, these performers weren't slain very often. They were too valuable, according to archaeologist Wolfgang Neubauer. Many former slaves also volunteered to be gladiators. With limited opportunities after buying their freedom, aka manumission, they essentially gave themselves back to servitude, swearing a gladiatorial oath to be burned by fire, bound by chains, to be beaten to die by the sword. Okay, for an oath, we've got to admit, the gladiator oath is pretty hardcore. But you gotta imagine conditions for freed slaves had to be pretty terrible if they were earnestly volunteering to fight to the death. One thing that urban and rural slaves had in common was that they both lived in rooms that were typically far removed from their masters and overseers. Domestic servants still lived in their master's house, sometimes even sleeping close enough to tend to his or her needs overnight. But there was a decided effort to keep slaves separate from free men and women. Typically, a slave's quarters would be located near storage facilities and were usually shared with other slaves. Imagine a bunk bed next to a garage, but Roman. If you were a Roman slave, chances are your style game wasn't exactly on point. Slaves were forced to wear simple clothing, not much different than garments worn by poor freemen and women. Masters provided a tunic of three feet and a half and a cloak once in two years. If you had a long torso, seems like you'd be out of luck. Also, once in two years, good shoes should be given. Imagine only getting one pair of shoes every two years. And this is during a time when duct tape didn't exist. To add insult to injury, male slaves weren't allowed to wear the one quintessential Roman fashion garment, togas. Female slaves were also forbidden from wearing stolas, a dress worn over their tunic. According to Seneca, the Roman Senate once considered instituting a uniform for slaves to more clearly distinguish them in society. They ultimately decided against it to prevent slaves from knowing just how many of their ranks existed. Bone chilling. Why would the Roman Senate be concerned that the slaves knew how many of them there were? Well, because there were a lot of them. I mean, a lot. The sheer number of slaves in Roman society resulted in tension and fears about revolt. Romans had a right to be worried. Slave tensions were rising in the Roman Empire, and it was only a matter of time before large-scale revolts began to bubble up. Aside from minor skirmishes, there was one famous large-scale slave rebellion that truly posed a risk to Roman society. Remember Spartacus, who we talked about earlier? The slave who was sent to train at gladiator school? Well, that same guy grew up to lead a slave revolt that included around 70,000 slaves and supporters fighting the Roman army. Now those are some serious numbers. Spartacus and his forces fought against the Roman military several times from 73 to 71 BCE, defeating them three times before being slain. According to sources, Spartacus fought valiantly to the end. Wounded by a spear thrust in the thigh but went down on one knee, held a shield in front of him, and fought off his attackers until he and a great number of his followers were encircled and fell. While Spartacus and his army may have lost in the end, their fight didn't amount to nothing. Concerns over future uprisings prompted some legal action to ensure, or at least encourage, better treatment of slaves. Unlike other historical forms of slavery, Roman slavery was not dependent upon race or ethnicity, and the number of slaves varied at any given time. After the Punic Wars during the 3rd and 2nd centuries BCE, thousands of men and women were enslaved, many of whom served as artisans, craftsmen, and agricultural laborers. As the empire expanded, Rome took more and more prisoners of war, and tons of non-Romans were enslaved, including individuals from Greece, Egypt, North Africa, Gaul, and Asia Minor. Apparently, Rome was an equal opportunity slave nation, I guess. Female slaves were not exempt from manual labor, but they often performed personal duties under the auspices of elite and wealthy Roman women. Slaves could be trained to apply cosmetics and do hair, kind of like a glam squad that's forced to be there and doesn't get paid. Other female slaves even served as wet nurses for wealthy Roman women. That is a one bad boob job. <laughs> Empress Livia, Augustus' wife, had more than 1,000 attendants, many of whom were female and male slaves alike. Female slaves were also vulnerable to the whims of male masters and could end up as the unfortunate victims of sexual abuse, sometimes with the masters charging a fee for the male slaves to engage in these heinous acts. Surrounded by all this pain and suffering, it's no wonder female and male slaves alike were itching to jump into the gladiator ring.
Slavery was pervasive and fundamental to the Roman economy, but there were different opinions on how slaves should be viewed in Roman society. Stoics, most notably Seneca the Younger, wrote about the relationship between slave and master, emphasizing the humanity of the former alongside the responsibility of the latter to be kind and paternalistic. According to Seneca, a slave sprang from the same stock, is smiled upon by the same skies, and on equal terms with yourself breathes, lives, and dies. Former slave Epictetus lived and taught in Rome, also calling for the fair treatment of slaves by masters. Epictetus found slaves to be noble, but is nobility the same as freedom? Mm, not exactly. One thing's for certain, any society that depends on slave labor is not a sustainable and just culture. Good thing slavery fell along with the Roman Empire in 476 CE. What do you think of the hardships faced by Roman slaves? Let us know in the comments below, and while you're at it, check out some of these other videos from our Weird History.